I'm Marshall Kozlov, and this is Arsenal of Democracy. Never before has our American civilization been in such danger as now, danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. My Hudson colleague, Brian Clark, senior fellow and director for the Center for Defense Concepts and Technology, joins the show to discuss how a software-centric Navy can address so many of the challenges the U.S. faces from the Ukraine theater to the Middle East, and of course, the Indo-Pacific. We also discuss how we could actually change the structure of the U.S. military itself to face the hedging challenges that we will face in those theaters. The F-35 is a perfect example of how that system might break down, right? So F-35 deliveries are currently on hold because they're waiting for the next iteration of its software, um, which is Tech Refresh 3, (laughs) to be provided to Hmm. the current generation of F-35s. Um, the reason that tech ref- refresh is in on hold is the software stack for it is a, a monolithic piece of software that they have to write the entire software package and then deliver it in you know basically physical form you know, to the aircraft and load it on with a, like a USB drive as if you were putting new software in your computer using a disk like we used to do mm-hmm. you know, 20 years ago. Um, as opposed to delivering software iteratively in modular form you know, via like a wireless connection. So we're doing software for the F-35 in a way that's like we would have done in the 90s. Whereas we deliver software to you know, drones and, and uh, other systems today like we would deliver to our iPhones. And we made reference to a bunch of different reports and posts. You can find those linked in the show notes. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Brian Clark, welcome to Arsenal of Democracy. Thanks, Marshall. Great to be here. Appreciate you asking me. Yeah, glad to chat with you, especially because the work you do at the Center for Defense Concepts and Technology is really at the core of what the Arsenal of Democracy podcast focuses on. Uh, Given that, how about you just start by introducing the Center and contextualizing its work within the broader Hudson universe? Yeah, so um, you know, we're uh, obviously, as the name suggests, we look at defense concepts and technology. So the implications of emerging technologies uh, for military operations, military strategy, uh, and increasingly, you know, mobilization and and how do we revise our approach to defense production and integration to, to try to make a more capable force, but also one that's able to operate at scale uh, and adapt in the ways that you need to for modern conflict. Uh, you know, we've, we, within Hudson, we're one of the research centers. Um, we're actually the, the first research center, I think, that was established in the you know, last five or, six, five or so years. Um, you know, we've uh, focused most of our effort on, uh, for example, unmanned systems and um, artificial intelligence, um, cyber operations and software, the role of software in warfare um, space. Uh, electronic warfare uh, and um, undersea and naval warfare. So we've we've it's a fairly broad reach, but uh, it's also kind of all focused on this idea of how does technology uh, change the way that we fight uh, and the way that we need to posture and and organize and uh, strategize uh, with our military. And your background obviously is with the U.S. Navy, and one of the pieces we're going to discuss today is actually writing about the opportunities that software provides for the future of the Navy. But I'm just curious, to what degree do the concepts and ideas we're going to discuss in this episode, to what degree do they actually kind of emerge across service arms of the military? To what degree is someone in the Air Force versus someone in the Army versus someone in the Navy having to think about these concepts, especially around software? Yeah, I think they're all trying to have it. They're all trying to deal with the same challenge or this opportunity. Also, you know, so the challenge is uh, increasingly the uh, capability that's resident in a new military system is in the software that controls it. Um, so uh, you're going to have to figure out how to buy software, how to adapt software, uh, how to field and and ship software in a way that's going to enable the kind of adaptation that our military forces need to be able to execute. Whereas in previous generations, we would have done that by shipping out a new piece of gear. And there's a defined you know, period for which you do that. And there's training and there's a logistic support for all that. When software is the heart of capability, there's an entirely different way you have to think about fielding and adapting military capabilities, um, which uh, also opens up the opportunity. The opportunity is software is obviously 
um, zero weight. Uh, in a lot of ways, <laughs> it can be adapted very quickly. Um, it, the testing of, of software is much faster and easier than it would be for hardware. So in a lot of ways, you know, software enables this degree of adaptation and flexibility that we've not really seen in previous generations of military systems. But you have to have processes and you've got to have people that are able to you know, harness that and manage it. Uh, and that's the the challenge, right? So it's working through these challenges and opportunities with software. And it's really inherent across the board, right? It's whether you're in the Navy or the Air Force or the Army or the Marine Corps. They are all experiencing um, this challenge and opportunity and you know, having varying degrees of success in navigating it. Um, and one of the things we tried to focus on in this article is, well, how's the Navy doing uh, in terms of uh managing the transition to what we would say is a software centric force, you know, a force where the capability uh, and the advantage increasingly resides in the software that's on the weapon system or in the command and control system that manages the weapons. And something I'm really curious about, I do a lot of work just in the broader tech and venture ecosystem, separate from just the military and strategic side of things. And if you really look at the 1990s. So beginnings <laughs> of like the really big commercialization of the tech industry and the internet. There's a real delineation between a tech company and a brick and mortar company. Think of Amazon, <laughs> amazon.com versus Walmart. As the internet evolves and software eats the world, though, the delineation stops making a little less sense. So yes, obviously, <laughs> um, Walmart has brick and mortar stores, but they have a major logistics arm. They're right. competing with Amazon in those categories. And Amazon is actually building up their own logistics and <laughs> their own, um, brick and mortar capacities. So I guess what I'm asking you is, at what point is software this different thing within the military versus just if we are running a program or if we're on the battlefield, obviously software is integrated into that. Does this del help me understand how we should make sense of this delineation? Right. Yeah. So I think um, if you, uh, you know, think about how you know, automobiles have evolved um, and how increasingly um, yeah, automobiles are differentiated based on the quality of their software stack, right? So um, you look at a Tesla, especially with electric vehicles, so a Tesla versus a BYD mm -hmm. or B versus another type of uh, electric vehicle. The performance differences between them are pretty minimal when it comes to the actual uh, the hardware of the vehicle. But really, the performance and the experience of the user is is mediated through the software stack. And so, how good your software stack is really starting to to show how good your car is. And and cars will often be you know rated poorly by their users if the software stack or the infotainment center or the the command center, the you know the, the climate control, all those things are not well organized and not well uh, you know interfaced with the user. Um, I think uh, that from our you know, personal lives is something you can translate over to the military and say the software stack is increasingly how the operator interacts with the weapon system because um, an aircraft, a ship, uh, a weapon is really going to be a bunch of computers with some software or some hardware behind it. But from the user mm -hmm. perspective, you're all only interfacing with the software, right? So all of the control system, all of the guidance and, and management system, the, 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 you know, decision making that that weapon system or that that ship or aircraft does that's all you know mediated through this computer so a, a pilot on an f-35 is really operating a computer the computer then controls the airplane um, and very little of it is like a direct you know fly-by-wire sort of interaction between the pilot and the aircraft it's all computer controlled um, and the pilot is really just sort of giving directions to the computer and then the computer interprets that and acts on it um, even a Virginia class submarine is that is that way now where you know the, the mm. operator of the uh, submarine is talking to a computer that computer then controls the operation of the ship's uh, you know, planes um, and you know the only thing that's not not controlled is maybe the engine uh, that's controlled by actual human with a throttle. But um, you're starting to see this transition to where basically the human's interaction with the weapon system is through the software. Um, and also, uh, particularly when it comes to um, unmanned systems, you know, obviously you're completely working through a computer um, when it comes to the operation of that system. Uh, and then the last thing is, is command and control and decision making. I think increasingly decision making is where um, you're seeing the edge uh, provided in military operations. That's always been the case, but I think Ukraine's a great example of how you can see decision making that's superior, such as what the Ukrainians have been able to do, um, has been able to get keep them in the fight despite the fact that they're at a numerical disadvantage. Um, and um, have always been playing catch up on the material side, but because they've had superior decision making through superior 
superior software. They've been able to organize their forces more effectively, mount operations that target the Russians in just the right place at just the right time, um, and stay in the fight um, and transition even to the new you know, kind of world of drone warfare, which is what's happening right now. Because they've been able to harness software and take advantage of what software can provide in managing the fight, um, and then empowering a new generation of unmanned systems that can be the you know the current weapons of of choice uh, in the Ukraine war. So, the the so- software is starting to provide the the secret sauce or the edge to militaries as they fight one another. Um, and and I think unless you understand you know, how that software is developed, how it interacts with the hardware, and how um, you can best take advantage of it for superior decision making, you're not going to be able to have an edge uh, against uh, a competitor anymore. I really appreciate that answer because you've done a great job of illustrating that this software centric conversation is already not only happening right now, but it's manifesting itself in everything from that F-35 reference you made to remote drone warfare to the battlefield of Ukraine. So what would you say then is the gap between the status quo and the call to action that you're really ending the piece with? Yeah. So the the challenge then is uh, if you're if software is increasingly where the uh, warfighting capability and the warfighting edge resides, we have to have a way for that software to be um, delivered um, to the the operational system, you know, to the warfighter that's doing the decision making. If it's a command and control system, you, or to the missile that's going to be carrying the software to execute an attack, um, or to the drone that's going to be you know, operating in this environment, or to an electronic warfare system, you know, that's going to be jamming somebody's GPS or somebody's GLONASS. Um, that software has to be delivered, and then you have to constantly be ready to adapt because the opportunity with software is you can adapt it very quickly to account for enemy mm-hmm. countermeasures. The challenge is then you have to have a way to ship it very quickly and test it and you know, deliver it to the to the system, um, just like we see with you know your 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 phone. So your your Google phone, your Pixel phone, your your iPhone, um, it's going to get software updates on a regular basis, um, and it's not periodic or scheduled. It just happens as they come up with new software packages and they get shipped. Shipped. But you have to have a pipeline to uh, build that software, evaluate it, then test it, and then you know, ship it to the user um, in a seamless way. So we have to have that in military systems as well. And the F-35 is a perfect example of how that system might break down, right? So F-35 deliveries are currently on hold because they're waiting for the next iteration of its software, um, which is Tech Refresh 3, <laughs> to be provided to hmm. the current generation of F-35s. Um, the reason that tech ref re- refresh is in, on hold is in part because of some supplier problems that uh, Lockheed have with some of its suppliers. Yeah, but it's also because the software stack for it is a, a monolithic piece of software that they have to write the entire software package and then deliver it in you know basically physical form you know, to the aircraft and load it on with a, like a USB drive as if you were putting new software in your computer using a disk like we used to do mm-hmm. you know, 20 years ago. Um, as opposed to delivering software iteratively in modular form you know, via like a wireless connection. So we're doing software for the F-35 in a way that's like we would have done in the 90s, whereas we deliver software to you know, drones and, and uh, other systems today like we would deliver to our iPhones. Um, so we've got to transition to a world where you can deliver software on a continuous basis through a pipeline that the service develops to deliver software. Um, and you've got to have uh, continuous authorities to operate. So the ability for um, the acquisition authorities to say this software can be delivered, this next tranche can be delivered, and just keep pushing the software out to the users. Um, that continuous authority to operate requires you to have automated testing schemes. It requires you to have modular software so that I'm not having to upgrade the entire uh, computer software all at once, like on the F-35, but I can up- upgrade pieces of it at a time based on you know what needs to get fixed or where my adaptation needs to happen. So that 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 modular approach to software development um, implies you know a federation you know of software systems operating independently inside of your your drone or your submarine or your aircraft, um, which means you have to have a different approach to software acquisition. You need to have software acquisition that instead of you know buying a disk like we do with the F thirty five is buying. <laughs> Um, services you know, from a software provider. Uh, and those services are organized um, in different parts of the ecosystem. So like your iPhone has apps, right? So the software for those apps is generated by somebody entirely different than Apple, but they've federated it such that that software can be de- you know, provided via the Apple um, App Store. 
And uh, that federated approach allows you to get updates to apps asynchronously you know, from one another um, as they become available or as, be as they become needed. Um, that approach is the approach you're seeing in more successful DoD um, weapon systems, you know, where you've got a federated approach to delivering software. The government defines interfaces between those different pieces of the federation. And then the, the pipelines for delivery of that software are approved by the government and can be operated continuously by those entities that are doing that under the auspices of the program office that's managing that, that program. So you see this, this effort to federate and you know, continuously generate software that can be delivered to the user and the, and the system in contrast to the old approach of delivering um, you know, a disk with a brand new software load for the entire system all at once, which means you, everything gets held up because the slowest piece of that, feder of that overall software stack is going to hold up every other piece of that software stack. So that's the tech refresh three story right there. You know, something I'm really curious about um, is, especially someone who swims in these circles a lot on your end, to what degree have you encountered anyone who's doing interesting thinking around the philosophy of, of programming and software, not just like creation, but iteration? Because think of, think of early 2010s Facebook, like obviously this, you know, motto didn't like age well at a society level, but like move fast and break things was actually a reference to this idea of, look, when you're programming, you're going to have to make trade-offs. We are going to, we, what we want to do as Facebook in 2011 is new updates, new programs, new ideas. And guess what? If you're moving so quickly that something breaks, no worries. We'll send a new update because once again, we're optimizing right. for speed. Obviously, that mentality when applied to the Western Pacific or the Middle East could be disastrous because if you're moving too quickly, um, breaking things late means literal human lives, not just sort of a broken Facebook timeline. So have you heard like any interesting ideas of how we should philosophically guide ourselves when we're thinking about iterating new software, new updates, et cetera? Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I think Sean Sankar, you know, at, at Palantir has had some really good ideas on this. I, I think you've had him on before. Um, yep. And also, um, you know, I mean, the, the folks at Android have some good ideas on soft, software development. Um, in terms of the government, you know, I think um, Seiko Okano, who's the PEO IWS or Program Executive Office for um, Integrated Weapon Systems in the Navy, has really taken this approach to heart. Um, and I think um, you know, we've also seen with uh, some of DIU's acquisitions, um, you know, they've looked at this federated approach as well. And that's partly driven by just the the way that they're organized, which is they don't have, you know, a, a systems engineering organization in DIU, and they will work with different vendors to provide different pieces of the software stack, which requires you to essentially have a federated approach just by virtue of the construct that they use for acquisition. Um, so there's some there's some interesting work going along those lines in the in the government where people are starting to embrace this idea. Um, yeah, I think the Navy's pro project overmatch. So Doug Small, you know, that the Navy has been operating that for a little while now, takes it that kind of approach too. They've built they've built their own pipeline for software delivery. They take a federated approach to allowing asynchronous you know delivery of different software elements inside of the combat system. In this case you know, for like the Aegis combat system and the associated uh, combat systems on uh, other surface combatants and carriers so that you don't have to replace the entire Aegis software load all at once. You basically can replace pieces of it in a containerized fashion, and those get delivered via pipeline that the Navy has got the authority to continuously you know, operate uh, and that does testing and delivery of software um, in a lot of ways automated in an automated way. Mm -hmm. So I think there's there are some green shoots out there of people who are starting to adopt this uh, different approach. Um, I think uh, you know, the government's going to need to build on those. Um, and uh, you know, there's a couple of things that, that sort of come out of this. You know, one is um, the some of the legacy weapon systems that are out there, or legacy combat systems out there, um, don't necessarily have the software, the processing capacity to to mount like a containerized mm. approach to software development. Um, they have to be highly integrated. They have to be all uh, monolithically developed because the software has to be as efficient as possible because there's such a low amount of processing power available on the platform. And in some ways, that's the challenge with with the F-35, right? As you've got a small amount, of, it's a small aircraft, right, in general terms, um, and its <laughs> processing power is constrained. And so to get that TR-3 Pro, uh, program load on there, you've got to really efficiently organize it. So that means in a lot of ways that has to be a, an integrated software package. Um, 
uh, I think, you know, with the F-15, the Air Force uh, has tried to address that by the F-15EX, the new version of the F-15, has a bunch of extra processing power on board. And people said early on, well, why did they do that? Why did they put this huge computer on this old airplane? <laughs> um, and it was because of this, because they wanted to be able to put in containerized software programs that can be federated and then allow for asynchronous software um, delivery. Uh, because you've got this greater processing power, it can accommodate the you know, somewhat inefficiency of having modular software uh, uh, development and delivery. So I think you're seeing, you know, a lot of examples of how the government is changing its approach to try to be more uh, flexible in terms of how it uh, brings on software and how it delivers software. Um, but the, the, we're still seeing, you know, the limit is, is people are not seeing the opportunity here. They're seeing, how do I work through the challenges of delivering software more efficiently? They're not looking at the opportunity and saying, well, if I could do this, um, I can gain this level of adaptability, decision-making superiority, flexibility, you know, and that would make it a much more urgent matter. You know, if, if operators um, and commanders in the field could, you know, can convey to the program offices that this isn't just a nice to do because it's a modern way to do software development. It's an imperative operationally. And I think Ukraine shows us um, that this is a, a really important thing that we need to pursue because otherwise we're going to lose the advantage against uh, a technologically advanced opponent like a, like a uh, China or even a Russia. I think um, the reference to Ukraine is a perfect pivot to, I think the really fascinating um, evaluation of the problem set at the start of the piece that we're referencing. We'll link in the show notes, of course. Um, you and your co-authors just point out that if we're looking at the war in Ukraine, if we're looking at the Red Sea, the Middle East, if we're looking at the Western Pacific, and then combined with the technological developments that are obviously have been discussed mm -hmm. in the first half of this episode, we're at a real inflection point that really mm -hmm. represents, um, and you're telling, uh, the equivalent of the transition from sail to seam from the 1700s to the, um, right. you know, to the 19th century really introduce your understanding of the historic moment that we're living in right now. Yeah. So I think the, the, um, yeah, there's two elements to that. You know, one is there's a huge opportunity in going to a new technology, right? So in, uh, um, 1800s, what the Navy had was an opportunity to transition to steam power from warships uh, because it gives you greater speed, more reliability in terms of actually being able to move from place to place, you know, and rather than depending upon the wind. Um, and then, um, you know, opportunities to you know, build larger ships, maybe heavier ships, different designs that can accommodate different weapons. Um, so maybe heavier artillery. Um, and then the power generation, you know, that would come from, you know, having a steam power, you know, could do electrical power generation. And then that gives you the opportunity for radar, which ended up actually being introduced in the early 20th century on steamships, as well as on, you know, other power, on, on traditionally powered ships or diesel powered ships eventually. So I think, you know, there's lots of opportunities there. The challenge, though, was that the Navy leadership still saw um, the, the downsides. Yeah, you know, there's challenges with ste with going to steam power also in that um, steam engines maybe you know weren't reliable in terms of you know they would break down periodically, whereas the wind you know doesn't necessarily break down. Um, so that reliability concern of uh, well, I've always got the wind, but I never know when my steam engine's going to break down. Um, the need to you know, deal with fuel and logistics, and so there's these challenges that come along with a transition to a new technology, and you have to weigh whether the opportunities uh, operationally are worth the challenges technologically. Um, and the Navy obviously eventually worked through that. I think we're experiencing that same set of challenges and opportunities here where there's opportunities with software in terms of you know, getting adaptability and decision-making advantage and you know, making um, uh, enabling a level of mobilization. This is something we're working on now. It, label, labeling, enabling a level of mobilization and production at scale because if you can um, make your hardware much more of a commodity and make the software where more of the capability resides, now I can enable myself to produce weapons at scale on demand and maybe more make make more adaptable weapons production than what I could do in previous generations. Like if you look at our current generation of high end weapon systems, there's almost no way to scale them, you know, at an order of magnitude, right? You can scale them, you know, incrementally, you know, uh, or, uh, arithmetically. So we're, we're increasing, for example, SM6 production, which is the highest end missile the Navy has for air defense from 100 year to 300 year over the next five years. So mm -hmm. it, that's a very incremental improvement. And it's because the supply chain for those is just so bespoke. Um, the hardware is increasingly sophisticated. It can only come from a small number of suppliers. 
um, you know, there's no way to modular, there's no way to rather uh, mobilize that at scale. You know, so if we go to shift to software being the, the heart of capability uh, development, uh, and then look at more commodity hardware and see what you can do there, you could enable a level of mobilization that's far beyond what we would do with today's systems. Um, so there's huge opportunities in software centric warfare. Um, but um, the challenges are, you got to have people that understand how to acquire software, you've got to incorporate um, you know, some practices that allow for continuous delivery of software and adaptation. Um, and you have to think about uh, the processing power of a platform as being just as important as its, you know, what warhead size or the sensor capability that it brings. So you have to think about different attributes being important in future weapon systems compared to current weapon systems. And you have to think about a different acquisition approach, which requires skills that are not resident in our current acquisition workforce. Um, so those are the challenges, and it's the same kind of transition as we saw when we went from sale to steam. Yeah, and I think the sale to steam parable is just so fascinating because I think, especially if you're from my generational cohort and you grew up with, you know, civilization or age of empires, you kind of imagine technological technological <laughs> development as being like a tech tree. So, okay, so you have stale, you, you, you have sales. So obviously you need to move to steam, but in that history, um, there's roughly that you all recount, there's roughly a hundred years of, okay, Steam could do this right. Right. to all of a sudden you're in, right. you know, the ba um, the Battle of Middle Bay during the Spanish-American War. So there's just a real understanding that this isn't a, a natural progression. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of issues that aren't even technological um, right. that are going to be introduced into this. So understanding that is just so helpful when we're looking at it. It's very obvious for us to say, well, obviously the Navy has to be software centric. Mm -hmm. But right. if you understand the seal, the, the sale to um, Steam parable, you understand right. that this isn't purely a technological right. capability question. So a couple uh, broad things as we go into the last third of this conversation. So number one, we'll do we'll do it one at a time. Um, I've referenced the the three theaters that anyone who's following um, the Navy's challenges and opportunities are focused on. Obviously, the Black Sea. Um, Russia, Ukraine, um, the Middle East, Houthi rebels um, launching drones and other forms of munitions at the at the U.S. Navy, um, and then obviously the challenges in the Western Pacific. I'd love you just to kind of like contextualize all three of those theaters from a how does this apply to the software conversation, but how do you identify the problems and challenges in those spaces? Yeah, that's a great point. So the um, so if you look at the Ukraine theater. Um, Ukraine's military has done a great job of taking advantage of software in terms of improving the efficacy of its military operations. So um, it's been able to um, use software for decision making to be able to deliver fires at the precise points that provide the biggest, biggest bang for your buck, right? So the most effect uh, against Russian forces. They've been able to use um, software to analyze using commercial satellite imagery you know, where Russia is deploying, what their deployment patterns are, what their operations are, what's their pattern of life, you know, where can I go and engage them most effectively? Um, they've been also using software to reprogram uh, their drone fleet, right? So they've built a drone fleet of thousands of drones. They're building drones at a, you know, at a pace of, you know, thousands per month to be able to use them as uh, weapons. So, so first person view drones, one way drones are becoming the weapon of choice at the at least the front lines of, of Ukraine and increasingly for longer range attacks as well. Um, but those drones are going to be somewhat susceptible to a bunch of countermeasures. So jamming of the, the global uh, positioning system the signals that prevent them from you know, finding where they are um, or spoofing you know, to, to deceive them as to where they are. Um, you know, it's all electronic warfare against the communication links. Um, so all those things are things that you can address through reprogramming by going to a different you know, waveform for your, your communication signals by incorporating features that allow the drone to predict where it is, even in the absence of a GPS signal, um, because it can use things like um, the detections from uh, antennas in the vicinity of known locations, right? So if you have TV antennas or cell phone antennas and you know where they are and you're getting those signals, you can geolocate yourself even without having a GPS signal. So there's lots of ways you can work through these countermeasures through software, and that's what Ukraine's been doing very effectively. So I think that's a good lesson for us uh, in terms of thinking about um, you know, the role of software and warfare, how increasingly it's the centerpiece. Whereas you look at, you know, what Ukraine's doing, the drones, either the, you know, maritime drones, the airborne drones, they're all relatively commodity hardware. I mean, they're building these drones in a lot of cases um, in garages using parts that they've been able to obtain 
you know, from the West in large part, but they're, they're commodity parts. They're not specialized parts for these drones and they're building them out of jet skis and, you know, other, you know, old drone pieces and creating these, mm-hmm. these systems out of, from scratch. So the hardware is a commodity. The software is where the capability resides. And we're seeing that with Ukraine. We're seeing them be able to mobilize at scale too, because of it. So there's some real lessons there in terms of, you know, mobilization uh, and the role of software and warfare that we could take advantage of. Um, Russia has not been able, does not, has not turned that corner, right? So Russia is still largely, you know, operating in a relatively straightforward hardware centric, you know, uh, perspective. They've been effective, you know, but, but they've not been able to take advantage of software in the way that Ukraine has. And um, then if you shift to the Middle East, you know, so the Houthis, I think what are, I'd argue are, are taking advantage of commoditized electronics, right? Because Iran is under a bunch of sanctions. Mm. There's, they're not accessing the most sophisticated military hardware, they're using commodity hardware and microelectronics that they've been able to obtain from the free market um, and repurpose it into their military systems and use software to help make the difference. Um, and they've been delivering those systems to the Houthis, who have also been reprogramming them to be able to you know, address U.S. countermeasures, to take advantage of you know, maybe some of the U.S. Uh, you know, signals that they can use as, as sensor you know, information. Um, so the Houthis have been reprogramming these systems in the field, even though they're a you know, disorganized or ragtag terrorist group, they've been able to use software to make up for some of the limitations of having uh, weapons that are based on commodity hardware, you know, extracted from the open market through, you know, various nefarious means. Um, so, you know, we can, you know, I, I think we can, you know, maybe poo-poo the Houthis is relatively unsophisticated or Iran as a, as a third-rate military, but they've been very effective at, at you know, holding um, at risk a bunch of U.S. and Israeli forces, and they've also been forcing the U.S. and Israeli forces to respond with very expensive countermeasures. So we're shooting down, you know, ten thousand dollar drones with two million dollar surface to air missiles. So we need to think about, you know, what's a different cost exchange we might be able to generate if we were to take advantage of these same technologies. Can we start shooting down drones with drones, uh, for example, and get that cost exchange ratio back down? That would depend on relying on software to a degree we don't do today, and at least in the mm-hmm. operating force. And then the last thing, if you look at the, um, you know, the U.S.-China competition, um, you know, the, uh, arguably this is where we can really get an advantage more quickly you know, because China does not have that same level of software uh, you know, acumen and is not fielding new software-centric systems nearly the same way that the U.S. could. So if the U.S. was to make this turn to a more software-centric force, I think we would def- definitely gain an advantage on the Chinese, both in terms of decision-making capabilities as well as the, um, uh, the the weapon systems themselves, you know, we'd be able to take advantage of uh, your know, commoditized hardware um, and you know extract more mo- more military benefit from it. But we'd also be able to take our legacy systems, our existing systems and weapons, and make them more capable in the face of Chinese countermeasures. So I think those are examples of you know kind of how we might be able to get an advantage. And the last thing I'll note is with China. Um, you know, China's got a distinct disadvantage when it comes to Taiwan in that um, it has to physically put boots on the ground to try to make an invasion successful, right? You're not going to, we don't have a lot of history in warfare of uh, aerial bombardment or cyber coercion or blockades really being successful, like bringing a country to heal, right? So if you want to seize a country or take it over, you have to eventually put people on the ground, which means they have to put boot, boats across the Taiwan Strait and the boats have to disgorge troops onto the shore. Um, which means you know, a lot of the same technologies that Ukraine has been using to attack the Black Sea Fleet you know, could be turned around and used by the U.S. or Japan or Taiwan to defeat uh, Chinese forces that are trying to seize islands uh, of their neighbors. So you could see the use of drones um, at scale, you know, uh, using software to both do their automatic target recognition, but also to manage them and allow their collaboration you know, in, in the most effective ways to, to, to kill ships. Um, you know, it would be in a way that, that, that these countries could defend themselves against China. Um, so China could be on the losing end, you know, of what, similar to what Russia has experienced, um, just because of the geography, you know, of the region and the types of targets that China's looking for. So China's at a disadvantage here where, you know, the capabilities that Ukraine has brought to bear could be used against it. And for the last two big things here, so once again, one at a time. Firstly, you've done a lot of really interesting work around just how the U.S. force structure should shift, given the centrality of questions around Taiwan to the 2020s. I love you just kind of preview a bit of that work. We've got some good reports that we'll also link in the show notes for interested folks, but I think that's a good uh, pivot there. 
Yeah. So the um, it, as we move towards a, a force design that's maybe thinking about software to an increasing degree and in, in the role of software in, in providing military capability, you, you'd kind of see you'll see this general shift from uh, large monolithic, you know, crude platforms, you know, that dominated that dominate our current military and certainly dominated in the past. So, you know, for the Navy, like aircraft carriers, destroyers, manned submarines. Um, you're going to see a shift away from those and towards more smaller systems, um, a lot of which will be uncrewed, um, that can be managed at scale, you know, by humans, but maybe not on board, you know, maybe the humans are removed somewhat from the uncrewed system. Um, but you can achieve the kinds of scale and the adaptability that you would need to get an advantage, uh, against an opponent like China, who's a peer adversary in terms of its you know, military capability and its uh, size, you know, in terms of its military size. Um, so, so what we're seeing in general is this shift. And so that we would argue that to accelerate that shift. So we should see um, in the acquisition of the future fleet, um, maybe fewer, uh, slowing down the acquisition of these large monolithic platforms. So reducing destroyer, submarine, you know, aircraft carrier production slightly over time to where you get to a smaller number of, of platforms that are these large manned platforms, you know, and increase the investment in either smaller manned platforms, you know, that take advantage of unmanned systems to generate a lot of their capacity, you know, or just straight up on crew systems, you know, that are that are operating independently. You know, they're not just a adjunct to the crewed platform, but they're able to do military operations on their own. So I'm thinking here of you know unmanned surface vessels that are large enough mm -hmm. to do their own open ocean uh, operations like anti-submarine warfare. Um, and then, um, also, you know, what, uh, the, um, we might be able to do with unmanned undersea vehicles in terms of, uh, protecting crewed submarines, you know, and preventing them from having to do a lot of their own self-defense, uh, and making them more effective because there's a smaller number of them, uh, but also being independently delivering, you know, effects like mines or, or, um, you know, weapons, other weapons like torpedoes. So you could see, um, uh, we need to see this shift in general away from, you know, a small, uh, a shrinking number of you know, monolithic, self-contained, crude systems to this larger number of uh, uncrewed systems with a small number of crude systems that are either there to you know, do like the the hard, harder operations like um, you know peacekeeping and and you know uh, uh, counter piracy things where you need people involved, and then you use these uncrewed systems to do a lot of the like, wartime operations that in in mm -hmm. you know, many cases are going to be in highly contested areas, and you don't want to necessarily risk you know crude platforms conducting these you know kind of knife fights uh, in places like the Taiwan Strait. So last question that I've been asking to virtually all of my guests right now. I'm always fascinated by a conversation like this because on the one hand, you're describing a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that there's still a lot of uh, way to go when it comes to integrating software um, into the Navy, especially um, the opportunities to develop a, a differently structured force that would take advantage of these trends and the frankly budgetary constraints that we're under. Um, so on the one hand, you have that conversation, the very future-centric conversation. On the other hand, um, anyone who's reading the reporting from Ukraine will hear conversations around manpower, mm -hmm. mobilization, mm -hmm. um, very traditional 20th century mm -hmm. framings. And I guess my question for you would be, how do you suggest policymakers, warfighters, technologists, et cetera, balance the fact that we're both living in the 2020s, but also mm -hmm. it feels very 1940s through 1950s. Right. Um, balancing these problems sets at the same time seems to be incredibly difficult. And I haven't assessed that we've done a particularly good job of framing things that way. So I'd love to hear your kind of advice for how we should think through this specific moment and its present and future challenges. Yeah. So I think in terms of you know, manpower, when we look at future force designs, you know, we need to look at manpower as a constraint. You know, so in the past, because we, we've done a lot of these studies, um, when you look at the future force design for the U.S. military, uh, we've only thought about you know, money as maybe a constraint, um, you know, procurement money at that point. You know, mm -hmm. So we need to think increasingly it's not just about procurement money, but it's also you know, operations and maintenance money. How much does it cost to keep this force? And then also personnel numbers. Are there enough people in the for in the you know that are that are likely to be in the military to or to operate this force? Um, we're doing a study for the U.S. Navy right now where we're looking at that and and operations and sustainment costs. Uh, personnel numbers are really the limit in terms of the design of the future fleet. Um, so increasingly, we have to look at that rebalancing I talked about in terms of moving from a you know mostly crude force of larger monolithic platforms to a force where that there's a small number of those 
uh, augmented by a large number of lightly manned or even uncrewed systems. Um, that's partly in due, to, due to personnel constraints. And you're seeing in Ukraine the same kind of transition, right? They're trying to transition to a force that is uh, you know, less demanding of the kind of number of people you know, that they've had in the past. So uh, the challenge, though, is that they don't have advantage, the advantage of technology, right? So they're using new technologies, but it's mostly stuff that they can build in, in the country because they've not been getting support from the West in the ways that they probably need to. Um, so they've had to you know, mount relatively manpower intensive efforts to build and field drones, right? Their drone operations are relatively manpower intensive because they're not as sophisticated as what might be possible if they had more Western support. So mm -hmm. the, you know, they're looking for ways to try to you know, reduce the manpower numbers by increasing the automation, not just of the um, of the uh the manufacturing of the, of the drones and get more in, the, in terms of software, but also in terms of, you know, being able to uh, organize and operate them in ways that, you know, require fewer people to have them in the field. Because right now, for example, for a first person view drone, you've got like two people that get the drone flying and, and maintain it and, and operate or manage it. And you got like two other people that are operating it and actually looking at it because it's a human on the, on the headset actually flying the drone. So certainly automation could be used to reduce those numbers. So and then the last thing I would say about Ukraine is um, if Ukraine had been uh, equipped to fight like NATO would have fought, you know, NATO would not have fought this um, kind of long slog artillery duel uh, in the eastern and southern part of Ukraine. You know, NATO and the U.S. forces would have used long range fires to take out Russian air defenses. Um, they would use suppression of enemy air defenses with electronic warfare. They would have eliminated the Russian air defense threat and gained air superiority over Ukraine. And then with air superiority, you can now mount the kinds of maneuver warfare uh, at scale that you could have pushed you know, you, the Russian forces back out without the kinds of manpower requirements that you have for long duration artillery duels. So I think when people say, oh, that you know, Ukraine looks a lot like World War I, that's only because we equipped it to fight like it was World War I. You know, if we'd equipped mm -hmm. Ukraine to fight like it was the 21st century, the manpower requirements would have been much less because we would not have gotten into this long um, slog, you know, where a lot of people were killed and injured in the process. That's such a fascinating place to end just because, to your point, it wasn't inherently an inevitability that Ukraine would end up looking like World War One in certain contexts. A lot of these things are, and let's say and this is the steam to this is the sail to steam at, uh, parable again. Um, there's a real need to understand how constructed so much of a reality is. And it'd be just too easy to say, well, the future of warfare looks like X because look at the war right. in Ukraine. It's like right. World War One. When you've pointed out, and once again, like I, I think many of the policy choices they got here are entirely defensible. Mm -hmm. So it's not mm -hmm. me sort of backward facing right. attacking those decisions, yeah. but you can't just look at any situation and just say, see, this is what everything looks right. like right. while ignoring the fact that very straightforward decisions, especially right. in the 2010s, were made that led to that reality. So Brian, that's an excellent place to end. Thank you so much for joining me on Arsenal of Democracy. My pleasure, Kyle and Marshall. It's great to see you. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe below so you don't miss any episodes of Arsenal of Democracy. If you'd like to learn more about the topics covered on this episode or just are interested in broader content on U.S. foreign and domestic policy, be sure to go to Hudson.org. See you soon.